Okay, I want to pick up and review and take a little, little further what happens when you eat. Okay, so we need to understand this so that we can intelligently answer my essay question on the midterm. Okay, so what happens when you eat? Four overall processes. The first is assimilation. Assimilation includes both digestion and absorption. So as we go through this, I want you to understand what each of these processes are and which part of the so-called digestive system is primarily responsible for it. So assimilation includes both digestion and absorption. What is the primary organ involved with both digestion and absorption as far as your overall digestive system is concerned? Yes, Joseph. Small intestine. Everybody's brain immediately goes to stomach, but what does the stomach do? Mix and store. Okay. But there's a little bit of mechanical <coughs> digestion and chemical digestion going on in there. Most of it would be mechanical. <coughs> All right, so the small intestine is the key organ of assimilation. The idea here is that the body must digest food into small enough form so that it can absorb the nutrients out of the food. The body must digest your food into small enough form so that you can absorb the nutrients out of what you have ingested. So digestion, we've got to break the food down into small enough molecules so that it can be absorbed by the circulatory system, by your capillaries in your small intestine, and also <coughs> Um, by the lymphatics. What structures increase the surface area of your small intestine, which makes this organ specifically designed for absorption? What are those called? The little villi, remember? If you were to look at the inside of your small intestine, it would look like it was carpeted, kind of like with shag carpeting. Oh, that's from the 70s. You guys know what shag carpet is? Okay. And then each of those villi also have the microvilli. And this increases surface area. The small intestine is designed to do absorption of nutrients. So the small intestine actually does both. Remember, the small intestine has three sections, the duodenum, the jejunum, and the ileum. Most of your digestion, where we're breaking down our food substances. Remember, we have three main classes of food that make up the bulk of our diet. What are the three main classes of food that make up the bulk of your diet? Yes. Yes, proteins, carbohydrates, and lipids are the three main, we call them classes of food that make up the bulk of your diet. Unfortunately, we have our diet a little too many carbs, not enough protein, and a little bit too many fats, or at least the wrong kinds of fats. All right, so what are the two types of digestion? Mechanical and chemical. Mechanical does not involve any chemical reactions. Mechanical is simply breaking down essentially into smaller pieces and mixing. We need surface area so that the enzymes can act on the food and break those molecules down into those building blocks. Okay, so mechanical digestion breaks your food substances down into smaller pieces so that it can be chemically digested, which is the next step. Chemical <laughs> digestion involves chemical reactions. That's kind of a no-brainer. But think about this, the chemical reactions that we're talking about require enzymes to break that molecule into smaller and smaller molecules. We call them digestive enzymes. And there's very specific enzymes that break down each of those food substances. And most of those food substances 
your proteins. Remember, proteins are very complex. We call them macromolecules. And so it takes several steps to break proteins down. What are the building blocks of proteins? Yes? Polypeptides. No, po proteins are polypeptides, and they're all folded together. What are the individual pieces? Yes? Amino acids. So amino acids are the building blocks of protein. So it's going to take several steps to break that protein down all the way into the amino acids. Do you think we can absorb a protein? No. We absorb what? The amino acids. So your body is going to assimilate what you use, both digestion and absorption. The digestion is necessary to break those food substances down first into smaller pieces. What's that? Mechanical digestion. Then into smaller molecules and smaller molecules, a lot of times in multiple steps, all the way down to their building blocks. Those are the nutrients that we can then absorb further down the small intestine. It's the duodenum, the first <coughs> foot or so of your small intestine, which digests chemically most of your food substances then the jejunum and the ileum will be absorbing those building blocks. Okay, what about carbohydrates? What are carbohydrates? Well, they're sugars and starches. The complex carbohydrates are polymers. What's the word polymer? It means long chains of repeating smaller units. So carbohydrates are polymers of the building block. What's the building block of carbohydrates? Mono, yes, monosaccharides. What's the most important monosaccharide? Stephanie. Glucose. What did we call glucose? The energy source of all cells. Now I am reviewing. I'm trying to want to put this all together so you understand it a little better. All right, so. The first thing that happens when you eat is assimilation. The body has to take in nutrients from what you ate. That involves digestion, both mechanical and chemical, and then absorption. Primary organ is the what? Everybody? Small intestine. Small intestine. Step number two, transformation. Transformation. What do I mean by transformation? The idea here is that the liver, the liver must transform the, the nutrients that we absorbed, whether they're the amino acids of proteins, the monosaccharides of carbs, and we left out the lipids. What is the main, what type of molecules are the main dietary lipids? What do we call those? Triglycerides. Do you know what a triglyceride is? You need to. It's one glycerol molecule plus three fatty acids. That's primarily what we call fat, but we'll call it dietary lipid, triglyceride one glycerol molecule, three fatty acids. Okay, so we're talking about now transformation. So then your liver will take the fatty acids. Your liver will take the amino acids. Your liver will take the monosaccharides and plus the glucose, not the glucose, the glycerol, and then even some vitamin and minerals that you have assimilated and the liver will transform them into needed nutrients and then synth synthesize the needed larger molecules. So the liver will transform <laughs> amino acids, fatty acids, monosaccharides into the needed nutrient. Your liver has the ability to change one kind of amino acid into another. That's what I mean by transformation. Your liver has the ability to take fructose and convert it to glucose. It's able to interconvert your nutrients. So that's the first thing that the liver does. The liver is able to transform or convert 
one kind of amino acid into another. The liver is able to transform or convert one type of monosaccharide, say fructose, into a needed monosaccharide, such as glucose. It's able to interconvert. The second thing the liver is able to do is build larger molecules that are needed. The liver is able to build hormones that your body needs. Your liver is able to build blood proteins that your body needs. That's why the liver is such a vital organ. Without the liver, you can't really use what you ate. You can't even really use what you assimilated into your bloodstream. <clears throat> so the liver is able to transform nutrients into needed nutrients. Interconversion of amino acids, interconversion of fatty acids, interconversion of monosaccharides. Then the liver is able to synthesize or build larger needed molecules, whether they're blood proteins, whether they're a structural uh, pr protein of some kind, whether it's a hormone that your body needs. Hormones involve both a cholesterol portion and a protein portion. Remember, your fats include mostly triglycerides, but also there's two other dietary lipids. Remember, what are they? Cholesterol and lecithin, okay? So your, lab up, your liver is able to do that. The third thing that your liver does, remember we did give functions of the liver, but in, as far as what you eat, it's also able to detoxify. That means it will convert a harmful molecule into a non-harmful molecule. It'll take a harmful molecule and neutralize it. Okay, so that is transformation and that is the liver. Step three, which we haven't talked about much, is use. All of your body cells will use what nutrients they need, what molecules they need, and leave the rest in the bloodstream. All of your cells. All of your cells are individually alive, so they have to have nutrients. They also have to have oxygen, but we're not talking about oxygen, we're talking about nutrients. So all of your cells, keep in mind they're individually alive and they have to have nutrients. They have to have oxygen. They have to have waste products removed. And that of course is the function of your circulatory system or your cardiovascular system. But it does involve nutrients. So all of body cells will use the nutrients they need and the larger molecules that they need and leave the rest in the bloodstream. All right, so what are the cells? Let's start with glucose. What do the cells need glucose for? Glucose is the energy source of all cells. So glucose will be uptake, uptake, uptaken out of the bloodstream. They'll uptake the uh, glucose out of the, new, the bloodstream, and then it will burn the glucose, literally. When we're talking about chemistry, burning means combining with oxygen. It'll burn the glucose to release energy. All right, what was the name of that process? Where does it occur? We talked about this with our carbohydrate metabolism. What is the name of the process? Yes, cellular respiration. I wrote this overall summary formula. Cellular respiration. So all cells do cellular respiration. All cells need glucose to produce energy through that, through several multi-step complex processes that we call cellular respiration. Where in each individual cell does this occur? They're called mitochondrion, or mitochondria is plural. Mitochondria, these are little tiny organelles inside each and every cell that a lot of people call them the energy factories of the cell. That's where cellular respiration takes place. All cells have them. I mentioned the other day that your muscle cells have 
multiple, multiple mitochondria. And we're going to talk about mitochondria again. We talk about exercise in a few minutes. So glucose is needed by all cells for energy through that process we call cellular respiration that takes place in the mitochondria. Then amino acids. That's another thing that will be in your bloodstream. What does the body use amino acids for? What are amino acids the building blocks of? Proteins. So your <coughs> cells will take amino acids out of the bloodstream. Your cells then will manufacture needed proteins. Even we think about, I talked about enzymes coming from your pancreas and helping your small intestine digest food. Enzymes are everywhere. There's enzymes inside individual cells. So all of your cells will take proteins, particularly amino acids, out of the bloodstream and make the proteins they need themselves to be alive and function. The cells have to make their own proteins. They have to make enzymes to do their cellular processes. They have to have proteins. Then we have fatty acids. Why do you need fatty acids? Fatty acids are the building blocks of the triglycerides, but the fatty acids themselves are important nutrients. When I say fat, you think of, oh, storage, and you think of what we had on the board the other day, adipose tissue. But fat is more than just energy reserves. Fat is also necessary to build needed molecules. So all of your cells will take those fatty acids and they will use them to build needed molecules. Individually, the fatty acids are used for construction of needed molecules. Overall, your body can store excess for energy reserves. So fat is not just for energy reserves. Fat is also an important building block of needed molecules along with the proteins. All right, so your cells are going to use those nutrients. Excess nutrients brings us to step four, storage. So we have assimilation, transformation, use, and storage. Okay, so assimilation is the small intestine, transformation is the liver, Use is done by all body cells, and then storage begins in the liver, and then will be throughout the body. So the liver will transform excess nutrients into long-term storage and send it to the appropriate place in the body. Of course, the form of storage is different forms of adipose tissue, commonly called fat. All right, let's talk about each one. Glucose, just like we did in use. Glucose. Glucose will first be transformed into glycogen. Here's glucose. That's our carbohydrate storage molecule. And a lot of this will be in the muscle so that there is a ready supply of glucose in your muscle tissue. But then when we have too much glycogen, we're gonna go to long-term storage, adipose tissue. This can be stored in the muscle tissue or in the liver. We're going to storage. Short-term storage, long-term storage. All right, what about amino acids? Amino acids will be converted to and most of the time we don't have a lot of excess amino acids. Most of the time they are going to be used for needed proteins, but eventually we will end up in the same place. Multiple transformations and so forth. Fatty acids. We'll end up in the same place. 
So we have four things that happen when we eat. Assimilation, which is both digestion and absorption. Transformation into needed substances. Use by all the cells. And then transformation into storage when we have excess. So that brings us to what I want to talk about, about diet and exercise. Since we just talked about storage, I want to ask and answer the question, why do we gain weight? Why do we gain weight? Number one reason. Yes? Lack of exercise. Well, that's my number four reason. My number one reason is too many calories eaten. Okay, our biggest problem is not, that is a problem, especially with children, lack of activity. <coughs> but the biggest problem is consuming too many calories. All right, then the second, just plain you're eating, we're eating too much. That's all that is. Number two, I want to talk about a little more detail. Number two is eating the wrong kinds of calories. Okay, there's, there's just no way to get around it. If you're gaining weight, it's because you're eating too much of the wrong foods. Too much of the wrong foods. There's just no way around it. All right, so the wrong kinds of calories. American diets are too high in complex carbohydrates or starches. American diets, first of all, are too high in complex carbohydrates and carbohydrates of the wrong kind. Here's the culprit, high fructose corn syrup. We put it in many, 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 I could almost say all of our products. But now people are more People are a lot more conscious of what they're buying and reading more labels, and so there are brands that are getting rid of the high fructose corn syrup. Why did we have all this high fructose corn syrup in the 70s, 80s, 90s, etc.? Because it makes food sweeter and it is cheap. Corn syrup is cheap, but it's not very good for you as far as nutrition. We're eating too many what nutritionists refer to as empty calories. That means I don't need it for energy. It's a carbohydrate. I don't need it for energy. So what happens to it? It gets stored. Okay. The second thing in our American diets are too much fat of the wrong kinds. What's the culprit here? Trans fats or so-called partially hydrogenated oils where we artificially, we artificially add hydrogen back to a fat. All right, so the problem with fats is it's the wrong kind. And it's in the wrong form. So it messes with our assimilation and our transformation. And so what does the body do with stuff it can't use? Stores it, <coughs> stores it, stores it. So maybe even if it needs it, if it's in the wrong form, oh well, we'll just have to store it, okay? A third problem, too many processed foods. Too many processed foods. Processed foods have been chemically altered. Have they been chemically altered for better nutrition? Some cases. But most of our commercially produced foods have been chemically altered for saving cost and increasing shelf life the bottom line of money, not nutrition. So the wrong kinds of calories, too many complex carbohydrates, too many of the wrong unsaturated fats, and too many processed foods. So we gain weight because we flat out eat too much. And we gain weight because we eat the wrong kinds of foods. All right, junk food. Junk food should be a treat, not a staple, okay? You understand what I mean? You can't be eating it all the time, whether it's what we call junk food or what we call fast food or whatever. So if you can store it in your dorm room without refrigeration, it's probably been too highly processed. 
Number three, we're going to talk about that in detail more next, so I'm just going to mention it. Poor metabolism. Your body's metabolism is not running efficiently. Poor metabolism. The body's metabolism is inefficient. It could, maybe it doesn't process the food properly for various reasons. We've been consuming the wrong kinds of foods for a long time. So poor eating habits give you a inefficient metabolism. And remember, when you get older, what's going to happen? It's going to catch up with you. Poor eating habits. By this, I mean both how much you eat, what you eat, and how often you eat. All three, what you eat, how much you eat, and how often you eat, okay? That's our problem, poor eating habits. How much you eat, what you eat, and how often you eat. Large, high-calorie meals are a no-no. And it makes them even worse when you eat them once a day. Say, so, well, I didn't have breakfast. Well, that's not going to help you save calories. That does not allow you to eat a lot of calories at lunch or dinner. Okay? Because all you're going to do is store excess. And the other problem with infrequent meals is your metabolism you trick your metabolism into thinking you're not getting enough calories, so it goes into storage mode, or we could call it survival mode. I don't have any nutrients. I'm going to slow down and use my nutrients slower. What happens when your metabolism slows down and you're using your nutrients slower? That means there's more accumulating in your bloodstream and more going this route. So it's not, it also involves your metabolism. You say, oh, I wish I was so-and-so. They have a good metabolism or they have a high metabolism. I do too. But why do you have a slower metabolism? A lot of it is your genetics. But then not just your, your genetics. Are, we're done with our genetics, right? You're almost adults. All right. So you have the metabolism that you're born with. That's true. But what you do with that metabolism depends on how you eat, how much you eat, what you eat, and how frequently you eat. So I can't control some of that now. You can control more of it than you think, especially the how much you eat and the how often you eat, okay? So years of poor eating habits. It's not a good idea to allow yourself to eat poorly. Fourth is what Joel said, not enough activity. So you're not burning the calories that you do eat. Not enough activity. So why do we gain weight? We eat too much. We eat the wrong kinds of foods. Too much processed foods, too many carbs, too many fats. We have a poor metabolism because this, we have the habit of eating poorly. And then we don't get enough uh, activity. So that's why we gain weight. So I want to talk now about your metabolism and your diet. Then we'll talk about exercise. As a review, we said that metabolism is the sum total of all the chemical reactions in your cells, in your organs, in your tissues. And we said there are two types of metabolic reactions, catabolic and anabolic. All right, with digestion, we are mostly dealing with, with diet, I mean, we're mostly dealing with the catabolic reactions. These are when we take what we eat and we break it down, break it down through enzymes to a nutrient form, to its building blocks, to where we can use it. And so one of the main things that we have to deal with when we're talking about our metabolism is energy. We said that glucose is the energy source of all, these are gonna be building blocks, the amino acids, the fatty acids, your body's going to make needed molecules with them. So what we want to talk about and center in, when we're talking about our metabolism, we want to talk about glucose. Glucose, let me make it neater, right a little higher. Glucose. 
Glucose is the energy source of every cell. And that glucose is often what we refer to as our blood sugar. Okay? It is glucose. It's a monosaccharide. It's the building blocks of those carbohydrates. Okay? And so we're going to process our carbohydrates into glucose and we're going to use them for energy. Each and every cell will take the glucose out of the bloodstream, okay, all cells. We're going to take the glucose, this is blood sugar, it's circulating in our blood, what we commonly call, you've probably heard about blood glucose, glycemic index, and so forth, all right, um, but the glucose is going to be taken up by all cells, and in the cell, we have the mitochondria. Those are the small little organelles found in all of your cells, especially your muscle tissue, that do cellular respiration. Here's glucose molecular formula. And here's what we're going to do with the oxygen. We're going to break this down in numerous steps and eventually we will get these waste products. We're going to have leftover water molecules and we're going to have leftover carbon dioxide. All right, carbon dioxide then will eventually be exhaled, right? All right, so this is cellular respiration. Notice we have a big molecule, glucose, and we break it down into smaller molecules, so this is called a catabolic reaction. We are breaking down glucose to release energy. But it's got to, what are we going to do with that energy? We don't want heat to come off, that would be wasted. We have to capture that energy. And energy exists inside chemical bonds. Where am I getting the energy? I'm getting it from the chemical bonds. So chemical energy exists in the bonds between the atoms of a molecule. It's chemistry, I know. But we're past 8 o'clock now, so we should be good. It's chemistry. We can't just have energy floating around. That energy has to be able to be transformed into a storage, some way to store it and transfer it, right? And that is ATP. There's anywhere up to about 32 to 38 ATP molecules that come out of one glucose, depending on which processes you're talking about and how many you're going to actually count. It's anywhere from 32 to 38 ATP molecules for one, from one glucose. Glucose is the source. But then, how are we going to capture our released energy? How are we going to transport it to where we need it? How are we actually going to keep a hold of it? It's in the ATP molecule. ATP stands for adenosine, that's the A, triphosphate. We have to capture our energy in a chemical bond or we're just going to lose it. We're going to capture it and transfer it in this molecule. This is known as the currency. Once we get our energy, we have to have a currency, a way to transfer it and spend it and use it. So ATP is how we transfer or use our energy. We have to capture it so we can transfer it. It's the currency of energy. Or this is the molecule we use to transfer and capture and keep our energy so we're not just wasting it. You've heard of the laws of thermodynamics, the law of entropy. that mostly applies to heat. Thermodynamics literally means heat power. And so the idea with the law of thermodynamics is that we're always losing energy. We'd lose all of this energy if we didn't have a means to capture it and kind of store it, at least temporarily, and then put it where it needs to go. And that is in the adenosine triphosphate molecule. And here's where it is exactly. What do you think ADP stands for? 
diphosphate instead of triphosphate. So there's this very high, in fact, when you write it in hand, when you write it as a symbol in chemistry, you use a very thick squiggly bond. Here's many times how adenosine triphosphate will be represented as adenosine diphosphate plus the third phosphate on the end. It's this third bond. So energy exists in the chemical bonds between atoms. That's true of all energy in all atoms. But in particular, it's in this third phosphate bond. So all of this energy that we released by breaking down and breaking up our glucose into these little, little molecules here, all of that energy that was released, we're going to capture it in the third phosphate bond. And that, call, become, that changes the molecule to adenosine triphosphate, ATP. Very key chemistry here as far as how you use glucose. So it's two things to make sure you know that the chemical energy that we need, that we produce by burning our glucose is in the chemical bond. And that bond exists between the third and second phosphate molecules, phosphate atoms in adenosine triphosphate. So glucose is the source of energy. ATP, adenosine triphosphate, is the currency that captures that energy so that we can transfer it and spend it, whatever. Currency is a good way to think of it. So when we are dealing with energy, we're dealing with glucose, we're dealing with each and every one of your body cells, all in this organelle. So this is where this occurs, in the mitochondria. Where does the energy exist? In this chemical bond, okay? And so this is how we measure calories. Every time we're talking about di diet, we're talking about calories, right? How much energy is stored and released here is all in terms of calories. Calorie is a temperature measurement, all right? Here's something else we do as Americans. On our package, we use the word calorie on our food packaging, right? But guess what we do? We don't want to think we're consuming too many calories. The calorie on our food label is actually a kilocalorie. Did you know that? Capital C stands for kilocalorie. Oh, that would look really bad on my candy bar wrapper, wouldn't it? So we just, by common usage, we, our commonly used calorie is, chemically speaking, actually a kilocalorie. What's the prefix kilo? due to a unit thousand times bigger. So a kilocalorie is what we use in dietary labeling, etc. A small calorie is the amount of heat needed to raise one gram of water one degree Celsius. Just do one degree C. Okay? So a kilocalorie is the amount of energy needed to raise one kilogram of water, one degree Celsius. So kilocalorie, usually written with a capital C, is the actual dietary unit that we use in our labeling. Okay. And then when we're dealing with our metabolism, we deal with capital C calories, a kilocalorie, and we also deal, we try to estimate ATP production. 
That, is, that can be done. We can estimate your ATP production by checking, I erased my uh, equation, but we can check our ATP production, we can estimate our ATP production by checking your oxygen usage, how fast your cells are taking up oxygen. So we can actually figure out a lot of things with our metabolism. So that brings us to the idea that chemical energy is measured in calories, as we said, and the kilocalorie is the dietary unit. <coughs> All right, so chemical energy is measured in calories, and what we actually use is the kilocalorie. That's how much, it's a measurement of heat how much heat is needed to raise one kilogram of water, one degree Celsius. Then your metabolic rate. Your metabolic rate is the amount of energy produced and used by the body per unit time. Metabolic rate, the total amount of energy produced and used by the body per unit time. And what this is, is an attempt to measure your ATP production. And this is measured by calculating the amount of oxygen used by your cells. They've worked it out that approximately one liter of oxygen is equal to 4.8 kilocalories of energy. So by tracking your oxygen use, okay, they can do this by doing your blood oxygen levels. They're not going to measure how much you inhale and exhale. That doesn't tell them anything. They're going to measure your blood oxygen levels. You've all seen the little clip thing they put on people's fingers and so forth. They can, it's called your pulse ox. Pulse X reader. <clears throat> anyway, they can measure how much oxygen is being used out of your blood. Okay, and that is about equal to roughly five calories, capital C calories. So then you, we can somewhat estimate your metabolic rate if we would bother to do so. Next, metabolic energy. Metabolic energy. Is, the energy, is how the energy produced by the body will be used. Your metabolic energy then is the next step. How is your body going to use the energy you just produced in the mitochondria of your cells? There are estimations on this. So for ev in every calorie that you use, it's believed that 60% of it goes to what's called your basal metabolism or your base metabolism. So every calorie that you consume, 60% of them, all the calories you consume, 60% of them go to maintaining your body's basic functions. That's basal metabolism, maintaining your body's basic functions. And this can be measured. It's called your BMR, basal metabolic rate. BMR, basal metabolic rate. This is the rate at which your body uses energy at rest. So to measure this, you would be at rest for a certain period of time. You will also have fasted a certain amount of time so that you can measure your basic me metabolic rate. If you have a high basal metabolic rate, you are gonna consume calories much faster and more efficiently than other people. However, this is very difficult to change. Okay, then 10% is how much you use to process 
foods and convert nutrients. So it does take 10% of your energy just to digest, assimil or assimilate, digest, absorb, and transform all of those first two steps. So this is called the thermal effects of food. 10% is what it takes to assimilate and transform nutrients. It's called the thermal effects of food. So if we're going to measure our base met metabolic rate, our BMR, period of rest and fasting. So that way we're not involving this. And the last, 30%. 30% is muscle activity. And that is both voluntary and involuntary. This is the amount of energy used by the muscles. All muscles, not just your lifting weights or running or exercising but all of your muscles. Of course, when you move, you use your skeletal muscles, but also your heart is a muscle, and your digestive organs involve muscle movement and so forth. So muscular activity uses 30% of your caloric intake, both your skeletal muscle and body movement, your heartbeat, your breathing, and even some of your internal functioning. Uh, this is the only one you can reasonably control. This one. You can increase your skeletal muscle activity. This one you can work on over time. And that's the key to a good diet is increasing your basal metabolic rate. You can also try to work on this a little bit so that your digestive system is uh, more efficient, but not really. This is the only one you can reasonably control. This one, you can work on it by changing your eating habits over long periods of time, and even then you may not affect it that much, okay? So, if you remember from the beginning, what are the three things that the body uses food for? Energy, right? Maintenance of body tissues, and proper cell function. Remember those? This is just the first one. This is how the body uses energy. This is how the body burns calories. 60% to your basal metabolic rate, just to keep your body functioning at rest. 10% for your digestive processes and your transformation processes. 30% for muscle activity. All right, so that's how your body uses energy. The thermal effects of food, your basic metabolism to maintain your body, and exercise. So let's talk about exercise. Exercise involves 30% of your caloric intake. Exercise. So first of all, benefits. The first benefit of exercise is it speeds up the burning of calories because you're using that ATP. You're actually using ATP, so your body is going to burn faster to keep that ATP supply replenished. Speeds up the burning of calories. Second thing that exercise does is it lowers cholesterol. Say, oh, I don't, I don't, what about my cholesterol? You'll be wondering about your cholesterol in about 20 years, okay? Cholesterol, there's two types of cholesterol, HDL and LDL. HDL, that's high density lipoprotein. LDL is low density lipoprotein. Have you heard of good cholesterol and bad cholesterol? Good cholesterol is HDL. The high density is the kind that you want because it, you have to have cholesterol. You need it in your body functioning, but you want the right kind. <coughs> HDL is the so-called good cholesterol. LDL is the so-called bad cholesterol. All right, and what happens is it lowers your cholesterol by stabilizing that balance. 
it increases the good cholesterol, HDL, and decreases the LDL. So it helps your body with its cholesterol levels. The third thing that exercise does is it increases the burning of adipose. Your fat, your stored fat. Increases the burning of your stored fat, adipose. Another one is it decreases insulin. How many have heard of type 2 diabetes, which is associated with older people and it's also associated with obesity? Why? People that have type 2 diabetes, they have plenty of insulin. They have too much insulin. Their cells actually become resistant to their own insulin. So that really wrecks havoc on their blood glucose levels, both too high, too low, all over the place. That's type 2 diabetes. So exercise helps type 2 diabetes by naturally decreasing excess insulin. And then it also increases your bone density. The more resistance you have on your bones, the stronger they are. As people age, particularly women, which involves different hormones, you're going to have trouble with bone density as you age. All right, you've heard of osteoporosis. That is dangerously low bone density. Then, of course, it also improves circulation. Circulation. Blood clots in the calves and legs can be a problem as you age as well from inactivity. So increased circulation. All right, exercise tips. First of all, just in general, consistency is much more important than intensity. So you go and wear yourself out exercising one day a week. Guess what? You're not doing a whole lot. Consistency, not intensity. Regular exercise much better than sporadic intense exercise exercise regular even if it's not as intense or not as much of a so-called workout consistency not intensity number two alternate exercise types aerobic and weight training number three Lack of exercise decreases muscle tone and tissue. So exercise needs to be a regular part of daily activities. I don't mean you have to go to the gym or the weight room every day, but exercise needs to be a part of, activity has to be a part of every day. Lack of it decreases both the muscle Quantity and quality, muscle tone and muscle amount, decreases relatively rapidly. That's what happens in space. There's no weight, so there's no resistance on both the bones and the muscles. And people that are in orbit at the space stations have to do exercise, okay? Otherwise, they come out with much less muscle mass and their bone density is in very poor shape especially the Russian cosmonauts. They weren't real concerned about the health of their cosmonauts, and so they didn't have the rigorous exercise program that the United States astronauts do. And they'd come off of their, they'd be in orbit too long, and by the time they get back down to Earth, they can't even walk. The very lack of muscle tone, mass, muscle mass, and bone density, okay? So, we talked about that. Then the next thing I want to talk about is, real quick, diet, do's, and don'ts. Diet, do's, and don'ts. Do's, first of all, drink more water. Recommend, recommended water intake is 64 ounces, not including caffeinated and carbonated beverages. It improves your body's ability to process foods. Number two, eat 
breakfast. You want smaller frequent meals, probably much smaller. Okay, if you are on a diet, so-called, in order to uh, lose weight and to uh, lower your calories, what do, what, what do all diets recommend? Breakfast, mid-morning snack, lunch, afternoon snack, dinner, and then even an evening snack. Spread out the calories. You decrease them and you spread them out. Number three. Another do, natural foods, as little processing as possible. I know you can't control all of that, especially not now, but you can in the future. Natural foods, less processing is what I mean. Don't, I don't mean get on the organic bandwagon or get on the vegan bandwagon. I mean, just try to eat things that are less processed. If the label of ingredients is that long, guess what? You don't want to eat it. Next, eat more fruit, fresh fruits and vegetables. Fresh fruits, fruits and vegetables. Number five, choose whole grains over white and bleached and processed grains. Whole grain breads, brown rice. Number six, avoid high fructose corn syrup and trans fats. Read the label. Avoid high fructose corn syrup, empty calories. Avoid trans fats. That has some adverse health effects on your circulatory system. And number six, choose healthy snacks. You want to limit, choose healthy snacks, limit Packaged baked goods, bad, 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 high in sugar, high in trans fats. Limit, if not eliminate, soda or pop or whatever you happen to call it. Limit your soda pop consumption. High in calories, you say I drink diet. Oh, we won't even go there to your artificial sweeteners. Too many calories, it also is highly acidic, empty calories, no nutrition. It's also very bad on your teeth. Don'ts. Don't skip meals. It lowers your basal metabolic rate. Number three, don't eat, or two, don't eat large portions. Don't skip meals. Don't eat large portions. Oh, restaurant serving size is enormous. You go out to eat, get the waitress to give you a storage container and immediately cut it in half and save it for later. That's a very good habit. We eat too much. Number three, don't eat empty calories. You want to limit your sweets, limit your pop. Number four, I hate saying it, but don't eat fast foods. I don't mean never treat yourself because that's not realistic but limit it. Same thing with processed foods. Don't eat processed foods. A lot of them don't taste good anyways. They're too high in sodium, they're too high in carbohydrate, and they're too high in trans fats. Sodium's another problem. And number six, don't graze. Do you know what I mean by that? That's mindless eating. I have a problem with that grading papers. Okay, I have at one point consumed an entire package of cookies. E.L. Fudge. Had to do something grading your papers. <laughs> All right. Then, we also did, never covered our vitamins and our minerals, so I want to just briefly give you my definition of vitamin. If you remember when we talked about our nutrients, we got hung up on our fats. So very briefly, what are vitamins? Vitamins are complex molecules needed in small amounts for healthy body tissue and proper metabolism. Complex molecules needed in small amounts for healthy body tissues and proper metabolism. 
Vitamins cannot be manufactured by your body. You have to eat them. They're complex molecules needed in small amounts for healthy body tissues and proper metabolism. Two ideas. They cannot be manufactured by the body. You must eat them. A second thing is they cannot be broken down by the body. They are used in the original or slightly modified form. Your body is going to not really digest them. It's going to just absorb them. A caution with vitamins is that they are easily destroyed by high heat. So you have to, that's why we want our fresh fruits and vegetables. Then there are two types, fat soluble and water soluble. Fat soluble are A, D, E, K. A, D, E, K. And then your C vitamin, vitamin C and all the Bs are water soluble. So they will be processed differently. Vitamin A is beta carotene. It has an orange, it's also got an orangish pigment. And when you overconsume vitamin A, it'll store it in your fat, the fat below your skin. That's why when babies eat too many carrots and sweet potatoes, they will get a orangish tint to their cheeks. <coughs> So what you're going to need to do then is read the Abeka biology section on the vitamins and minerals. Because then a mineral is an inorganic element needed in trace amounts for proper cell and tissue function. Inorganic element needed in small, or trace, trace amounts, tiny amounts for proper cell and tissue function. These are vital for function. And I want you to look up and pay attention to these. Calcium, potassium, iron, sodium.